started here. Welcome to the Technology Source Virtual Roundtable. We will be starting here in just a few seconds. Um, I just want to see who's here with me today, and then we'll let me get the audience pulled up. Here they are. All right. Well, good morning, Cal. Hi, Ed and Fred. Hi, Irwin. Hi, Rob. Hi, Takuya, Matt. Awesome. Hi, Matt in Seattle. Hello, Theo. Oh, it's so good to have you all here. Thank you. Every two weeks we do this. So uh, many of you I see come back again and again. Really appreciate that. Um, hi, Ron. Hello. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, and hi, Matthew. Uh, another Matthew. Hi, John. Welcome back. Thanks for coming. Week, every, week after week. Here we are again. But this time it's something new, something different. We try to keep it new and different every time. Um, so we will get started in just a few seconds. Um, and I will be able to introduce to you our special guest. Um, and my name is Sonia Maline. I'll get my introductions out of the way. Sonia Maline, uh, Chief Information Officer with Technology Source. And so you are in the right place. We are having the Technology Source Virtual Roundtable. Uh, we do this every two weeks. We bring experts in all different areas from mobility and internet and you know, Wi-Fi and security. And today we're gonna talk about ransomware. <laughs> so. Um, a really interesting topic and it just keeps growing in um, popularity, sadly. It's like one of those yucky topics, but it's one of those things we need to address. Um, hi, hi, Godwin, nice to see you, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, we're just letting everyone trickle into the room. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. I'll share uh, my screen and, and then we can kind of go from there. Um, so my name again, Sonia Moline. I, I have with me today, um, get to that slide. Uh, as I said, we're talking about ransomware readiness. Are you prepared and welcome? Um, oh, and just a little housekeeping. I will be uh, asking every 10 minutes or so, trying to stop and ask if there's questions unless, um, unless Joe stops me. <laughs> and, and, but we wanna ask questions. This is for you to ask questions, for you to learn. Um, and so if you ask a question, we'll put your name into this hat. It's kind of like a hat. And then at the end, we have a couple giveaways. I think we're doing two uh, $25 gift cards. So that's always fun. So thanks. So we have Joe Wade here today. He is a senior sales overlay with TPX. He has loads of experience and he's going to talk to us about his expertise in cybersecurity today. Joe, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. And pleasure to meet everybody. Joe Wade, um, Security Overlay at TPX. Also do a little bit of advisory services. So that means consulting, uh, risk management, control frameworks, all that bit. Um, so any questions at any point, don't hesitate to stop me once I get into my portion here. Pleasure to meet you all. Great. And where are you today, Joe? Are you in your home office or are you in the office office? No, I am in my home office. Um, I'm in Connecticut, actually, Southern Connecticut, not too far from New York City. Um, very rainy today. I don't know if anybody else is on the East Coast and in this area, but it's a little miserable out there. So hopefully I can brighten it up if possible. <laughs> oh, good. Well, uh, it's a bright sunny day over here for us, uh, for me on the West Coast um, in Northern California. So happy to have you. Thank All you. right. Um, so today we're just going to talk a little bit about who we are, and then we're going to hear quickly right off, move quickly through that and hear about the TPX presentation on ransomware. So we offer a technology source, what we call the elements of business success. I will show you those elements in a visual presentation, but here are what we have. Cybersecurity, business optimization, software and applications, connectivity, mobility, cloud infrastructure, marketing, voice and communications. And here's what that looks like, um, just with a little bit of a visual, because each of these elements is you know, filled with lots of other products and services. So cybersecurity is a really broad category, right? And so is business optimization and software and applications. We do offer connectivity services as well as voice and communication. Marketing, we just started offering that two years ago, huge success for the digital marketing. Mobility, it's very important, especially with today's work from home environments. And then of course our cloud and infrastructure to kind of be the infrastructure and the foundation of uh, an organization's business. So we at Technology Source source all of these products and services for our customers, over 3,500 customers 
um, around the United States, around the world, really. Um, highly reviewed. I encourage you to check us out online just if you're interested in getting to know a little bit more about us. Why would you go with direct, uh, Technology Source instead of going direct over to Wade at TPX? Well, that's because we have over 3,600 business customers and we represent our customers and we are agnostic. So whatever services that you choose, uh, we help you connect with the vendors directly. You buy directly from them and you don't pay us anything, but we have this weight of all these customers behind us to help you get the best pricing, the best services, the best, um, you know, uh, SLAs, uh, negotiate your agreements, all that stuff. We take that off of your shoulders. So uh, why are we talking, what are we talking about today? Cybersecurity. So some of the other services that we offer are penetration testing, multi-factor authentication, managed firewalls, web filtering, endpoint management, spam filtering, mobile device management, cybersecurity as a service, desktop as a service or DAS, and dark web monitoring. So when you're working with us, we have hundreds of providers that will compete for your business to help you source all of these different services. Um, also offering business optimization, um, and, you know, I already mentioned it, but cost reduction, increased reliability, improved communication with the vendors, making sure that, you know, you don't have to bump your head on something we've already seen another client bump their head on with one of the vendors. So we kind of, you know, just make things work smoothly for you. Um, and these are the steps. It's really easy. Um, if you wanted to engage with us, we work with you to have a strategic business conversation we introduce you directly to the providers that you need to meet with, and then you work directly with them. We're there to back you up throughout the whole process. So this is our team. We're happy to be here for you today. And let's hear, um, oh, some of our customers, happy customers, I said, like, we're highly reviewed. Um, I will share this slide again at the end if you wanted to reach out to me. Definitely reach out to the partner who invited you today or any advisors if you have any questions to speak with any of the things we are talking about today. So that's what I have. Let's just um, hand it over to, to, to Joe. So ransomware, um, that's what we're talking about today. We're eight minutes into this one hour presentation and I am excited to learn new things about ransomware and also to hear about the special offer that TPX has for business customers out there. Um, the only quick story I have is I was working on a impact analysis for a hospital system in a um, in a remote county, but nonetheless, a very large county in California. And the hospital system had chosen to do this impact analysis rather than move forward with some of the products and services that I wanted them to move forward with. So I helped them with the impact analysis because that's what I do. I'm a compliance officer by, by trade, uh, IT director by trade. And unfortunately, in the six month impact analysis process, they did get hit with ransomware, had to send out first class breach notification letters to over a million of their patients. Um, and it was a huge, huge issue. It was, it was very sad. And had they you know, kind of listened to some of the stuff that I had recommended in the beginning, they wouldn't have had to deal with this ransomware breach. Um, and so that's one of the things, obviously we can't ever per se, we're gonna protect you 100% against ransomware, right? But what we can do is layer on the protections and see what, um, you know, what we can do to protect and also do these impact analysis so, so we know where the ransomware is going to affect most. And so we can kind of guard and protect those. Um, so that was just a quick story that I had on a personal big, big project that I was working on. It, it wasn't a, a happy story, but it was a cautionary tale that I do tell customers who are concerned about ransomware, you know, definitely get it on your roadmap right away to protect as much as you can. And so that's why we have TPX here today. We want to learn more. Um, tell us, tell us more. Perfect. Joe? Perfect. Yeah. Thanks so much, Sonia. Um, so yeah, again, Joe Wade, I'm going to be joined here by Dave Hagen, who I think is having a little trouble getting in here. Um, oh, I see him I'm, here. Awesome. Welcome, perfect. Dave. Beautiful. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for being here. I think he's working on his audio, but great, great timing. <laughs> yeah, perfect. perfect. Um, so yeah, I'm a security overlay here at TPX. Um, today, we're going to be talking about one of the tools that we use for customers to kind of get a better idea of where they stand in regards to ransomware. Um, really, because it's a time to get introspective about security. Um, and as we know, organizations typically shy away from the topic. And most of the time, it's because it's a frightening topic. 
But really, security is a primal instinct, and the majority of our life actions are efforts to feel more secure. And when talking about ransomware, it's really our jobs as thought leaders in security to get after the real threats. Because our customers, they sit through presentation and presentation. And when you see maybe a slick about remote remediation or even a slick about next generation firewalls or maybe even a slick about backup and replication, this is what your world starts to feel like. Everybody remembers the teacher from Peanuts and Charlie Brown, wah, wah, wah. You're sitting there thinking, who cares, right? What are the actual dangers? And quite frankly, and unfortunately, we're all victims of marketing all the time. But threat actors are really not in the game to bully companies anymore. They're more so Ocean's Eleven style heist masters, right? It's about capital gain now. And really what most companies are worried about is walking into work and seeing this, because this is their worst nightmare. You don't want to walk into work and see that your entire infrastructure has been compromised by ransomware. And quite frankly, a lot of us, we go home and we flip on the news and our world is filled with this. And it's the easiest thing to do is adhere to business as usual. Or the most common thing we do is nothing. And this is a very real quote. The name is redacted for obvious reasons. Um, but it's certainly disturbing given the fact that all the while threat actors are continuing their pursuit. Unfortunately, this is a game that never stops and executing ransomware is becoming increasingly more simple. Let's look at some statistics here. So this is encompassing 98% of ransomware attacks. So 52% of ransomware attacks occur over external remote services. So any applications that use remote desktop protocol, 29% um, of ransomware attacks occur utilizing phishing techniques and 17% exploit public facing applications. Almost all ransomware attacks are executed across the, these most three common attack vectors. Now, to most of us, this is a recognizable login screen, right? to the uninitiated if you were asked to sign in to google using this login screen an alarming number of individuals would just do it but wait a minute this one looks a tad different and when you look at them side by side the differences become sort of jarring and i'm sure you're wondering where i'm going with this but yes one of these is fake you see google security measures have a very specific authentication process they like to verify you're in the system before asking for your password. The one on the left is a spoof Google authentication page. And quite frankly, this is a prime example of social engineering. And to tell you the truth, this was one of the first attacks I learned in my offensive cybersecurity program. I tell you this to emphasize the fact that this is a basic attack that people fall for every day. Crippling an organization could really be that simple. So a step to mitigate this is the ransomware readiness evaluation. Um, so today we're gonna to be talking about what is a ransomware readiness evaluation? I'm gonna abbreviate it as RRE as we go throughout this. Um, how we recommend and prescribe a solution um, the, and how it's an opportunity to build a relationship with a thought leader in security. And lastly, how do you leverage it moving forward? So what is a ransomware readiness evaluation? So it derives from the Department of Homeland Security CSET ransomware readiness tool. CSET stands for cybersecurity evaluation tool. Um, and we designed the RRE to be the most efficient security discovery tool. How, where are the pain points, right? Um, this is an opportunity to have a conversation with the security leader already on the line. And we rank each area on a high, medium, or low risk scale. It's a 30 minute, 11 question, high level interview. Um, really the purpose is to recommend and prescribe. As we talked about the three most common attack vectors are phishing, so that means your email server, or it can come um, in the form of social engineering like we saw with the Google authentication pages. Um, web application services, so these are your word processors and CRM tools and remote access. So. Anything that utilizes RDP, you know when IT has to remote into the computer to fix something, 
Um, quite frankly, this is a no brainer for hackers. Taking complete control of your system is typically step number one. It's also an opportunity to find the danger. Um, we don't like to assume that every individual we speak to is a security expert. Uh, we speak to people every day that simply don't have the time to think about these things, right? Um, this is supposed to act as a helping hand. And lastly, on this point, it's to provide a roadmap. Once we hand the report back, we don't just go away. Uh, we want to be able to prescribe the best solution stemming from the information provided. Building a relationship, and this I believe is the most important piece of having this tool. Um, building a relationship, and that is built on trust and networking to secure your network. Uh, the idea is to make you feel more comfortable in your security journey. The RRE provides the connection between us and you. Um, and we being the security experts. We want you to have someone to reach out to. It's not just about helping make a network secure, but we want to make you feel more secure as well. Um, and the idea is centered around a consulting service, right? Addressing human necessity. We want to act as that helping hand. So once you have the tool, what do you do with it? Um, like I said, it's a roadmap to a better security fabric. That means revisit the report or the conversations that we had and use that as leverage. Um, we provide the opportunities for talking about the hard stuff. A lot of times we don't like to talk about things that we already know are problems, right? That means in any stage of this engagement, if there are any areas that need to be addressed, don't hesitate to bring those issues to the forefront. A lot of times, because we all have so much going on, we don't allow our problems to become real, but the issue is that problems never get addressed unless we accept reality. Um, lastly, and let the findings speak for themselves. If you're having trouble securing budget or can't get a project started due to a lack of resources, this can kind of get your foot in the door to start solving those issues. Now, I have a case here. Um, we talked to a physical security company, so that means um, CCTV. Um, and quite frankly, even physical security experts need a watchdog. Um, they kind of had nothing going on in terms of security. The, the IT director there just didn't have the time to even take a step back and think about where do I stand in regards to security. They had uh, no documentation on hand. Um, it was a 12 man shop and the IT director was kind of acting as a field technician as well. Um, so with that, like I said, it was one location, 12 people, and we got into this by conducting a ransom and readiness evaluation. Uh, the we found that really vulnerability and vulnerability assessments were the first and foremost action they needed to take. Um, when we think about risk management, we think about two things, right? We think about vulnerabilities and we think about threats. Well, the vulnerability assessment takes care of one of the most vital parts of risk management. Um, and some of the you know some other things that came up during the conversation were they didn't have secure endpoints, they didn't have a secure firewall, and they didn't have secure backups. Um, the cycle took about three months. And some of the key questions that we addressed were, do you know which vulnerabilities exist on the network? Um, and of course, the answer was no. And when phishing attempts come through the email server, what immediate actions do you take? Nothing. Um, this is you know, drawing back to the most common thing we do is nothing. And that's the easiest thing to do, quite frankly. Um, this is just a, you know, a use case to kind of get the gears turning here. I'm gonna pass it over to Dave, who's got some other um, verticals that he'd like to talk about. Great, well, while we're waiting for him to get his audio and video turned on, I do have a couple quick questions from the audience. And yep. just a reminder, audience, um, you are a part of this virtual roundtable because we love to hear your questions and you know, you've know you got some experts here. Um, and if you have a question, it's probably pretty uh, certain that somebody else on this uh, roundtable has the same one. So it really helps us. And we are giving away a 25, two $25 gift cards for, for great questions. Um, okay, so Ed P as in Papa says, do you recommend implementing 2FA, I think that's two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication to help mitigate attacks? If so, do you recommend taking a step further using a hardware key or do you believe uh, that software 2FA is fine. 
Yeah, um, so one of the important questions during this interview is, um, are you utilizing multi-factor authentication? So I'm really good. Uh, I'm really happy that you hit on this good point here. Um, yes, I, I, absolutely two-factor authentication is a necessity. If we look at the Colonial Pipeline, right, that kind of devastated the Southeast for a while. Um, we look at that case and we see a VPN account that lacks multi-factor authentication. Now those credentials were spread across the deep web. All a hacker had to do was pass some crypto along. Um, they had those credentials and because it lacked two-factor authentication, all they had to do was plug that in and they had access to the Colonial Pipeline. Um, so it's absolutely a necessity. And you said, if so, do you recommend taking a step further and using a hardware key or do you believe software 2FA is fine? Um, I think having an extra layer of authentication in any case is beneficial, uh, whether it be hardware or software. Um, quite frankly, if you don't have that layer, then you're missing a, a step. So first, first case, whether you're considering hardware or software, just address the fact that you should have two-factor or multi-factor authentication in any form. That's that's for that's case number one. Okay, great question, Ed. This one is from John B, as in Bravo. Does it seem that ransomware cybersecurity insurance is providing a false sense of security for organizations? False sense of security, I think, is it's it's a little harsh. <laughs> I think I think having cybersecurity insurance is is surely beneficial. Um, in in layman's terms, yeah, I, I do think that a lot of organizations kind of use that as a fallback. Um, I have cybersecurity insurance. That means I'm completely covered in the event of anything, and that's just entirely false. Um, let's consider the threat landscape in general for a second, right? Um, and I'm sure you've heard about zero day attacks, zero day threats all the time. What that means is that this threat landscape is constantly evolving. Um, as we're speaking right now, someone is developing a new technique. Millions of people are developing new techniques to execute um, any sort of attack. Having cybersecurity assurance is a good fallback, um, and it's a good thing to kind of look at. But in, in general, um, cybersecurity is ever evolving and having you know, certain parameters around certain things according to your security fabric, um, I think it's looking at it in a very narrow view, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I agree. And just like from a standpoint of getting the persistent negative media exposure from a ransomware breach, if you're a, you know, a trusted healthcare provider or, uh, you know, trusted company that people shop at or whatever, right, you know, nobody wants their data to be hacked. Um, and so that persistent negative exposure from the media, there's no, there's no amount of insurance that can ever really cover that harm um, and that risk to your business. So while I think, yes, absolutely get that insurance, if you can even get it, because you have to have a lot of the stuff in place that we're talking about today with TPX to, to take those steps, or otherwise you pay huge amounts anyway. Um, so, but great questions. Uh, we'll just ask maybe one more, unless your team's ready to speak. Let's, let's, what about this? Um, Question from Ed P, as in Papa. Um, do you believe that? Uh, okay, Ed is equating kind of like how movie actors have to, you know, do um, rehearsals before they shoot a scene, and he was kind of equating that. Do you believe that the same applies to cybersecurity? Should tests be run periodically to identify security weaknesses and vulnerabilities? Um, so again. Yeah, Go ahead, Joe. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. And, and I really appreciate the analogy there. I'm a, I'm a film buff, so that's that's cool to see. Um, yes, no, absolutely. I think the idea of tabletop games might be a little antiquated, um, but in order to kind of understand where your gaps are, of course, everybody should be doing some sort of, um, you know, even a mock attack, if you will. Um, and if you haven't looked into it already, think about gap assessments, right? So the gap assessments being a part of the risk mitigation, um, you know, efforts. Uh, and what gap assessments are really to do is find those holes, right? And then once you have that assessment done um, and get the proper recommendations, you're able to then go ahead and plug those holes. Um, but yes, doing some sort of dress rehearsal, so to speak, and you know, kind of setting the stage for an attack and then seeing how your organization would go and execute it is absolutely highly recommended and is definitely best practice. 
Great. Okay. One last question and then we'll let you keep going with this presentation because I want to hear these case studies. Um, Gwen was saying, do you provide a package for cybersecurity for healthcare companies? Um, sure. So we, a part of the consulting services that we do, um, again, going back to the gap assessment, I wouldn't necessarily call it a full package, um, but in order to really be compliant with HIPAA, which I know for a lot of healthcare organizations, that's top of mind is being compliant with HIPAA. Um, and I know that specific industry is constantly facing audit all the time. Um, so yeah, I mean, in, in terms of getting that full package idea, you wanna think about gap assessment, uh, maybe a vulnerability assessment, and maybe even a, um, a pen testing um, engagement as well. Uh, I think those things are, are really important. And I think those kind of encompass the whole idea of risk management and risk mitigation. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of a full package to covering those endpoints, having the right backup solution. Um, and I know there's another question in here that kind of addressed security awareness. And if I could, Tony, if I can go into that and kind of address yeah. that as well. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, so this is kind of a segue here. Um, I know I saw one that kind of talked about security awareness training and, and what the efforts are for that. Um, so to address that properly, it's to talk about continuous security awareness training, right? Um, a lot of times what we do is a Tuesday in January, one time a year, where IT comes in and says, hey, don't click on these emails. Um, that's quite frankly, these days, not enough. It's not enough. Continuous security awareness training means um, phishing simulations. It means um, educational exercises. It could be quizzes, videos, anything like that, but it has to be continuous. Uh, doing it three to four times a month is continuous. And we, it, the idea is to take you from the, I don't know, I don't know something to I know something so well that I don't have to think about it anymore, right? Security awareness should be muscle memory for all of us. And when we think about the threat landscape and we think about phishing in general um, and the end user and how most attacks occur because of human error, these are the things we have to take into account. So security awareness, in my opinion, is the biggest ROI when it comes to security. Awesome, great. Well, we have a lot of uh, other questions, but let's hold a few and, and I wanna hear this case study. So let's hear that. Dave, take it away. Let's see if you can get on there. Um, I'll just ask to unmute. I don't think either of them have their um, video on. Here we go. <laughs> now that's Christine actually, so. Okay. So I think we are doing the case study with David Higgin, and I don't know if he was able to join Joe. I know he had a problem with okay. the link. Yeah, I don't think he was yeah. able to. This is Richard, by the way, Richard and Christine. Oh, okay. We, we were both, <laughs> because we logged in with Joe's credentials. That's why I said okay. Joe three times. <laughs> well, hopefully yeah. you can fill in for him, Joe. Yeah, of course, of course. Perfect. Um, so this is, this is another case study here. Um, and it's how can I be prepared to protect against ransomware? So this was a county mosquito control district. Um, and yes, even county mosquito control uh, organizations or you know that specific committee has these same issues um, and kind of getting into what it all entails here. Um, so they had three locations. Um, they were kind of looking at managed backups and disaster recovery, but this stemmed from a ransomware readiness evaluation. They didn't know that they had these issues going on internally until they had that ransomware readiness evaluation. And kind of hearkening back to the idea that a lot of times we don't recognize something as real until we say it out loud, right? And this is a prime example of that. Um, so some of the questions that you know were asked to kind of drive this were, um, the need to be able to recover from a ransomware attack. Um, and that leads right back to the backup solution and disaster recovery. Um, they never tested against the backup and restore process, but they needed the ability to virtually restore in the cloud environment. Um, and of course, do you have the proper resources to manage your security needs? Their IT department was a little understaffed, and that is a, the case with a lot of organizations. A lot of organizations, it's you know one to two people shops, um, and with everything going on, 
there's no way that you could cover every single aspect of security, making sure that those areas are completely secure in terms of your security fabric in totality. Um, so that's just another case for the ransomware readiness evaluation. And then getting into the automotive industry as well. Um, so what really matters is protecting all sorts of companies. So they had five locations. Well, just, I just think that's great though. I mean, I'm thinking I want to go to my county and make sure because you know all of our private records are here in, in your counties. And so every one of us on this should go speak with your county and just say, hey, you know, here's a case study about this. It's really important. So I really appreciate these. I think case studies are the best way for me personally to absorb any content or material um, because then I can go, oh, I can apply this to this. So super helpful. All right, sorry. I just wanted to say, yay, I love case studies. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. Um, so again, another um, industry here, automotive industry, they have five locations. Um, but in order to really uncover this is what is your cybersecurity plan? And a lot of times there is none, right? Um, and uh, in this case, it was very hard for this specific IT director to retain, um, you know, competent, if you will, IT resources. And that's kind of the case, you know, there's a, there's a huge skill gap right now going on in IT and security as well. Um, so this is an, another perfect example here. And I have a slide for questions. I know there's a lot of people asking a lot of questions and I want to make sure I get to all of them here. Okay, perfect. All right, so let's answer some questions here and just throw them out there. I see a ton, so uh, keep them coming. And if you want to minimize your screen there or maximize your, um, your audio, your video there, then we can see you answer these questions for us, Joe. All right, so first question from Wayne is, do you have any introductory questions to initiate the conversation? Uh, this is from one of uh, our technology source partners um, who may have a customer on the call today and you know, just wanted to know what customer he should invite to these kind of uh, events like this today or even just to meet with uh, their customer personally. What's the, is it the CIO, is it the CTO? You know, is it the CEO? Is I personally, I work a lot with CFOs because they're like, you know, a, a ransomware hit would, would just completely cripple our organization and the finances are my baby, right? And so they're very concerned about that. They're very concerned about their accounting data, um, patient data. So, um, but, but Joe, who do you see making these decisions for the most part? Great question, Wayne. Yeah. And we're putting your, in the, your name in the hat. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely a great question. Um, the tool is really designed to have that conversation with the IT person first and foremost, right? Um, because a lot of times when we talk to them, it's like, I can't get my CFO to budge. I can't get the CEO to budge in terms of budget. Um, so the idea is to have something tangible in the form of a report to say, hey, I had that conversation. I had that tough conversation. I had to sit through that and, and relay everything that's wrong with our security fabric. And this is what the security experts had to say. Um, so, you know, and to get that project going, uh, most of the time, that's all they need. Who would I, who, to answer your question, who would I invite? Um, the person who's most engulfed in, in the uh, IT fabric, the person who knows the ins and outs. Um, we've sat with just about everybody. Um, we've sat with account managers, we've sat with IT people, we've sat with uh, CIOs, CFOs, CEOs, um, but we found that you get the most profitable or most, um, um, you know, yeah, profitable information from the IT director or somebody who's working with the technology every single day, because they know the most about it. They're going to be able to tell you exactly what the issues are. And a lot of times those issues that they're going to be relating to you are things that they've had top of mind for a very long time. Um, it's just now that they have the opportunity to sit down and have a conversation with somebody about it is the most important thing. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things like, like, just get it done. You know, I, I have a, 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 a case study about the Keck Medical Center, um, which is funny because they're the Trojans and they were breached by a Trojan, right? It was, it was a ransomware um, and kind of, you know, a little ironic, but also very sad because, um, and this is, um, I'm bringing up this case study because we have Takuya 
N is in November, who is talking about how effective are virus scanners and content filters on your mail for protecting your servers and preventing ransomware. And this, this is exactly great question. I mean, very effective for the most, most of the time, but when they're not, uh, as in the case with the Keck Medical Center, they had, you know, latest and greatest spam and virus detection and web gateways and, you know, everything was there, but it just one user like clicked on one thing. And then next thing you know, every user was infiltrated by this ransomware. It's, and it's public, public um, case study. You can take a look, but um, how effective Joe, would you say when it's effective? Um, it's, a, it's, it's effective in the sense that it's it's tough, and like I, I I keep harkening back to this, but I want to make it clear that that the threat landscape is constantly evolving. And if you take anything away from this, if you take anything away from this conversation, is that the threat landscape is constantly evolving. So when we look at effectiveness of of really anything, we're looking at. 10 steps ahead. What's it going to be like tomorrow? What's it going to be like a year from now? How far have we come from a year ago? Um, so that's really that's really my my answer to that. <laughs> uh, without well, you know, I don't I don't want to kind of you know put any sort of idea down in terms of enhancing your security fabric, but keep in mind that we are on a a fast moving roller coaster in terms of where this is going and how much this is ramping up. And I, I kind of want to put this into perspective too. When we look at, when we look at ransomware and when I first got into offensive cybersecurity, um, ransomware wasn't as big of a topic as it is today. Uh, a lot of times it was to bully companies, um, like I touched upon in, earlier in, in the uh, presentation. Um, a lot of times it was necessarily to get a little bit of capital, but it was a lot of script kitties, right? And when we say script kitties, we're talking about you know, hackers that are, you know, 13 to 18 years old that just have nothing better to do. Um, but they, you know, they think this is fun and they know that they can kind of get something out of this. And it's more of a, I know I can do this. I can go and brag to my friends about it. Um, I was one of those kids. <laughs> um, but, you know, so right now we're dealing with APTs, right? And we're talking about advanced persistent threats. So when we look at, you know, probably the most common one is anonymous. Um, that's kind of the household name. Um, this is a huge, this is a huge scale. We're talking, we're talking big time. We're talking lots of money, um, lots of resources that companies are shelling out to get their data back. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. I kind of went off on a tangent there, but <laughs> if that didn't, just let me know. <laughs> no, it's good. I mean, when you're talking about um, the ability for anyone who has an internet connection to go online, any age, any income level, anywhere in the world, any level of malice, or, you know, like maybe somebody who's just having fun, you know, but anyone can do it. And it's like, that's not a good thing, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty scary. And so when you're saying, okay, let's just guard against the top threats. Well, that, that doesn't work anymore, you know, because those top threats are, are so varied and so wild that that's just not even a possible um, way to look at, at, at threat protection and, and these, these APTs. And um, yeah, so great, great answer. Okay, so next question from Cal H as in hotel, what are the common cybersecurity threats? I mean, this is kind of what we were just talking about. Even if they are common, um, you know, even if you took the top 10 threats, that only represents something like 0.0001% of all the threats that are out there. If that gives you some idea of the magnitude of the threats. So, uh, but but good question. What are the most common cybersecurity threats that you've seen late, lately besides Log4j? Thanks, Cal. Yeah, that's that's a good one. Um, probably social engineering is is the biggest threat, I would say. Um, and I'm, I'm not talking about a specific script or malware that's being deployed or um, I would say top of mind for a lot of people. And if there's, again, anything you could take away from this, um, it's social engineering techniques. It's those people that are, you know, not necessarily up to date in terms of things that they should be clicking on or shouldn't be clicking on. Um, and the biggest threat to cybersecurity is us, right? Are the, are the end user, the people who are sitting on the other side of the computer, um, you know, not paying attention to what we're doing. And a lot of times too, and especially in this new work environment, you gotta keep in mind that you might have your Gmail account open up to your work email and how that might not necessarily cross your mind when you go to click on something. 
Um, and think about the fact that we're all use social media. So that means that people have a way kind of into your life, right? They can find out what makes you tick. If you love golf, you might get an email from, you know, uh, you know, the golf club company saying, hey, we have this free offer for you. And a lot of people don't even think twice about clicking on it. Um, the biggest threat right now and uh, to cybersecurity is us. And I, I stand by that. <laughs> Right. Well, and, and one question we had um, from the audience, I was looking for one that was pretty, well, we've had two questions that are, are the same from Godwin and uh, Godwin P as in Papa and Ravens. Uh, these two questions are, what are the cybersecurity trends? Um, I think they're very similar to the last question, you know, the top threats, trends, top threats. Um, are there any trends that we haven't talked about yet that uh, maybe are new that uh, we should all be aware of? Trends as in ways to protect or, or things that are being deployed? Sure, ways to protect or things that are being exploited, vulnerabilities that are, are newer, uh, newly exploited recently, anything like that come into mind? I think that's what they're wondering. Any yeah. new, anything new to be aware of, to be scared of? <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah. and and quite frankly, I think I think the the method right now of of um, antitrust, right? So that means going back and validating. A lot of times we use tools that are um, AI focused. So that means that you know artificial intelligence is going through it and verifying that everything is working properly, that the proper security steps are are being um, used. Um, when we think about antitrust, that means that humans need to go back and then validate those things. Um, so I would say probably the most important security trend right now, um, and uh, you know, we hear about zero day threats and we hear about file, fileless malware attacks. Um, there are actually ways right now that AI is executing ransomware. Um, on top of that, ransomware as a service is a big deal now. So that means people are getting packages essentially from the dark web um, and deploying ransomware. And it's just, it could be anybody. It could be anybody. Um, and the reason why we're seeing that kind of hockey stick and that, that uptick in ransomware attacks is because of that, how accessible it is to everybody right now. Um, but to answer your question, I'd say probably antitrust is is top of mind for a lot of people on my team, for myself in, in general, um, because AI doesn't know everything. I mean, we try to program computers to do things most efficiently, but there should be a human that goes through and verifies as well. Um, I don't know if you had anything to add on that, Sonia. No, I think I think that's great. Um, and I think just as soon as you think you're ahead of the, the threats that are out there, there's gonna be somebody that'll create a new one. So that's why creating as much uh, layers of security. And then it's not just it's not just that, it's a process, you know, it's not just a product. So it's a process within your organization. Um, so I, I have a bunch of questions on data backup. Um, just to mitigate ransomware, do you have a uh, best practice? Um, and this is from Takuya. Um, and as in November says, how often should the data backup uh, be done to mitigate ransomware as a, as, as a best practice? And I, I'm obviously, all these questions are like, well, it depends, right? But um, I, I guess it depends on the business and those types of things. But um, do you have a, a response there, Joe? Yeah, to scale, um, I would probably say, you know, if you have an office with about 150 people or less, um, I'm, quite frankly, your data should be backing up about every 15 minutes, right? Um, to execute a ransomware attack doesn't take that much time. Uh, you need to kind of have, and it's not just about retention time or, you know, how, how often you should be backing up. Um, it's about having to that on-premise and off-premise backup. Um, people are kind of doing away with backing up to their local machines and everything is being spun up in the cloud now. Um, but it should be backed up, if, if not daily, if not every 15 minutes, at least daily. Um, but again, it depends on, on scale and how much data you're, you're utilizing every single day. Um, but having a kind of a hybrid solution that on-prem and off-prem solution is step number one. Establishing that is step number one. You should have something physical. It could be even a hard drive, um, but then, then that kind of gets into the problems with physical security, right? Um, I know a lot of cases when you do, you know, gap assessments or any sort of, you know, audit, a lot of, you know, companies will go through and drop uh, USB sticks throughout the office to see if people are picking them up and plugging them in and stuff like that. Um, 
but there should be something physical and then there should be something spun up in the cloud as well. For an office, I'd say of you know 150 people or less, um, at least daily, at least daily. Retention time, try to get it infinite, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully, but yes. All right. Um, okay, Demetrius uh, F as in Foxtrot says, if you could implement one thing to prevent an attack, what would it be? <laughs> Sure. Um, I would probably say because most attacks occur at the end user, um, some sort of endpoint security piece, right? Um, that means that there's patching being done. That means that there's um, next generation antivirus on all workstations. That means that there's DNS filtering. Um, that means that there's some sort of instant response um, going on there, but the most important piece of that, and the, I'd say the capstone of that endpoint environment is the security awareness training. If you're going to implement anything, um, it's the security awareness training. It's really jarring to see click rates, and this is these are real statistics too. People, you know, or organizations having click rates of 80%. That means 80% of their users are clicking on malicious emails or simulated malicious emails. Seeing that. And then having it drop to 5% because of security awareness training, that means that you're taking 75% room for error out of the equation there. That's huge, that's huge. Um, and given the fact that human error is the number one cause of all of this security awareness training, if you're gonna implement anything, step number one. Great. Okay, question from Cal H's in Hotel says, what are the best practices for enhancing Wi-Fi security? Um, Multi-factor authentication, uh, 100%, probably number one. Um, also, password management, right? No, we don't really think about that as much. Um, we kind of base our password on what we'll remember the most, right? Um, but a lot of times you were using the same password that you used for your, your AOL account 10 years ago. And unbeknownst to many, those things are being spread all around, all along the uh, the dark web. Um, so somebody could have your credentials and they just haven't gotten to you yet. Um, password management being huge, multi-factor authentication. Um, I think I think those are the two big points there. Also, also first of all, public Wi-Fi. Um, start thinking about the words open and public and equating those words with the word vulnerable, right? A lot of times users will, if they're traveling a lot and they're in an airport um, and they're like, I got to get on this call. I have to get on this call. Can't miss this call. So what do they do? They connect to the open environment. <laughs> that is a vulnerable environment. You don't know who's on there. You don't know who has access to that. Um, so yeah, those those pieces, those pieces. Yeah, no, that's good. And then Ed P is in Papa is uh, kind of piggybacking on that question about passwords, uh, and he's wondering, you know, weak passwords, reusing passwords, obviously a significant source for attacks. Do you recommend a password manager to properly manage and secure passwords? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and a lot of us are using, you know, Active Directory with domain trust policies and all that, um, but. I know on, on in a lot of organizations, they have kind of like, you know, a, every 90 days change your password sort of thing, which is which is a best practice. Don't get me wrong, that's a best practice. Um, but also consider just how each password is kind of, I know, for example, <laughs> and I, I hate to say this, but I, for example, kind of like to have a password that I remember. And keep in mind, a lot of people are doing that. So you, you should have some sort of, um, proper, you know, length involved, you know, eight to 16 characters, um, special characters, you know, the, the whole uh, numeric um, capitalized sort of thing. Um, but there should be some sort of, you know, at some point, everybody in the organization has to change their password, um, because you just don't know whose credentials are floating out there. And that happens all the time. Great. Well, thanks for letting our audience kind of pick your brain on a lot of this stuff. Um, I know the end goal here is for our anyone who's on this call that's interested. Um, can we talk a little bit about the the product um, or service or the special offer kind of that we're talking about today? Sure. Christine, I'm going to let you take that one. 
Or are you talking about awesome. the ransomware readiness evaluation, right? Yeah, let us let us know because um, we want to share this with our customers. Anyone who's on this call today, folks, you can reach out to myself. You can reach out to um, any of the advisors or partners who invited you today, and we will connect you with Joe and his team and get that assessment started. Um, can you just tell us a little bit what what does that look like? How long does it take? And, yeah, and is absolutely. it how much does it cost? All that stuff. How, well, let's we'll start with how much it costs. It's free. <laughs> it's, well, it's, that's it's, nice. it's <laughs> low, <laughs> low barrier to entry there. Okay. It's entirely free. Um, the purpose of it is to kind of, like I said, get those gears turning. Because a lot of times we know that there's issues, we know that there's problems, but until we say it out loud, then it becomes real. Um, so that's the first. Yes, it is really free. I saw that in the comments. Yes. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? <laughs> There's no caveat here. I am no, no. Um, so yes, yes, it's absolutely free. It's 30 minutes, um, 11 very high level questions, right? Um, so we look at the three of the most common attack vectors, like I said, which was remote access, phishing, and web application services. And we've kind of distilled those three most common attack vectors into um those 11 questions. So it's it's going to be relatively rapid fire, um, but it's it's a chance for us to get an idea of what you're working with in terms of your security fabric. But to take from that is the recommendations that we provide after that interview. Um, so we go through each question and provide you with the best practice to use if you're not using the best practice already. Um, and then we risk, we rank each of those areas on a high to uh, medium low risk level so that you can kind of get an idea of where you stand based on those 11 questions. Um, I think I touched upon everything there for that, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Great, no, that's, that's really helpful. So these assessments are um, available right now. Um, so if you are a customer today, or if you are, you know, know somebody who has uh, an organization, a business, something like that. So please reach out and um, and and so why TPX? Uh, we'll close with that and then we'll do our drawing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the cool thing I think about what we do here at TPX um, is that we take the idea of security and kind of it's it's not about getting the sale done. It's not about you know all the, all the nuts and bolts and really what it's about to us is that consulting piece we want to make sure that you have that helping hand right um a lot of times you you know talk to organizations and you might do an assessment right um and then they just give you a report and say here's all the problems we like to walk you through those problems uh because a lot of times it's hard for organizations to get the resources get the time um, get the manpower to tackle all of these problems um so our security overlay team at TPX, we're very hands-on, uh, we're very personable individuals, um, and we take consulting as the number one area of focus when it comes to security, because you kind of need that helping hand today in 2022. Well, great, and we have some people asking about how to reach you, and so I'm going to put my slide up here on the screen just so you can send me an email if you have any questions and want to get this um, this kicked off. So uh, here is my information. Hopefully you can see it. Um, let's just skip the animation there. <laughs> Sonia.emmet technology source. So reach out to me and I will through diligence figure out how you were invited today, which partner or um, uh, which which of our advisors invited you and we will all work together to get you all set up. So um, thank you again. I'm going to uh, do our drawing here. Uh, TPX is a longtime partner with Technology Source. Many, many of our customers using them. And so very excited that you guys were able to come in today and bring your expert Joe on. So thank you so much for that. Um, so let's just do some uh, drawings. We have two $25 gift cards from TPX. Thank you for that. Um, our first winner, actually, let's skip a drawing. Let's do a question. Uh, how about this? Question, what are the three most common threat vectors for attackers? It said twice in the beginning and at the end. So I'd love to see, you can just type that right into your 
um, chat box there. I'll ask the question one more time. What are the three most common threat vectors for a $25 gift card? The three most common threat vectors. I'll give you a hint because nobody's getting it. Nobody, nobody. Bueller. I'll give you a hint. One of them starts with a P. Oh, we got it. Oh, John B. As in Bravo. Congratulations for $25 gift card from TPX. All right. Next one we have is we'll do a drawing for this one. Get down in the very, very bottom there. Oh, it's a very small one. Very small. I ran out of paper, so I had to start ripping it up very small. Gwen, oh, Godwin, P as in Papa, Godwin, email me and we will get you those uh, gift cards, Christine and our team here. Thank you so much, Richard and Christine and Joe for putting this all together. Fabulous information. Um, we really, really appreciate it. And we look forward to getting these assessments for our customers kicked off right away. Great, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. All right, we'll Thank see everybody back. back in two and a half or so weeks. Uh, we'll, we'll send out an email and let you know. We are changing the link, so everyone will have to re-register for the next virtual event, but that's okay, just, just a heads up there. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you again, Joe, and thanks TPX, wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, bye-bye.